When my parents graduated from college in 1992, they were in such difficult financial conditions that it was sometimes hard to find a meal for days. They had both completed economics degrees from the University of Lagos, the best college in Nigeria. They had dreams of finding great jobs, getting married, having me. <laughs> but after months and months of searching, the only job my dad was offered with his economics degree from the best college in the country was as a vodka salesman. I asked my dad what that period felt like, and he said, you just feel stupid. You lose your dream. Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. Eventually, my dad went through an apprenticeship program, learned to become a mechanic, and used the skills he learned in college to start a successful small business. But my parents wanted more for their kids, so when they could, they brought me and my siblings to the United States. That decision is a big part of why I'm here with you today, the daughter of a car mechanic at one of the best schools in the world. I almost certainly wouldn't be here if they hadn't made the decision to leave Nigeria. Chances are my story might have looked a lot more like my cousin, who graduated from college two years ago, and after all this time trying to start a career in Nigeria, is still mainly doing odd jobs. The truth is, circumstances for young people in Nigeria aren't much better today than they were 30 years ago. Youth unemployment across all of Africa ranges between 12% and 30%, depending on the country, even though the average African is better educated, more urbanized, and better connected than at any point in history. It's easy to blame poor leadership or bad luck or the legacies of colonialism for these issues, but those don't tell the full story we have some responsibility too. Many of us who grew up in the West have been taught to think about Africa through two dangerous frames. First, as a single monolithic entity, and second, as a place of need and not opportunity. And those flaws in our thinking have devastating effects for African people and businesses. African VCs receive just 1% of global VC financing, even though the continent makes up 18% of the world's population. 54% of African entrepreneurs say they don't have access to enough capital to start or scale their businesses. And when a disaster happens in one African country, investors pull out of a different one, even if it's thousands of miles away, because they can't quite tell the difference between Kenya and Liberia. But despite these challenges, entrepreneurship is thriving on the continent because the opportunities are so obvious to people on the ground. The African continent is growing faster than almost anywhere else in the world. In fact, by the year 2100, two of every five people on Earth will be in Africa. Household spending is skyrocketing far faster than the global average. And by the year 2075, fully a third of the world's working age population will be in Africa. The question isn't whether you should invest on the continent. The question is when. Looking ahead to the future, the bulk of the world's people, entrepreneurs, and workers will be in Africa. What they need is transformative investment. When I first arrived at the GSB, I would often say to people that I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next, but I knew I wanted it to be focused on the African continent. The other person would typically say something like, wow, I wish I was a good enough person to go into nonprofits. It struck me every time because the intention was good, but you can hear the implicit assumption in that statement. We think of Africa as a needy place and that blinds us to the opportunities to invest there. That's a problem. It's especially a problem for Africa's young, ambitious, educated people who miss out on opportunity because the capital that creates good jobs and funds entrepreneurship is sent elsewhere. In the cases where African entrepreneurs receive the investment they deserve, their businesses thrive and those leaders are able to use their proceeds to make further impactful investments. One example is E, who founded Africa's first uh, unicorn. 
After scaling his business to over 1,000 employees and more than a million customers, E went on to found Future Africa, which provides seed funding to other African entrepreneurs like himself. Within just one year, Future Africa had nearly quadrupled their LP's initial investments. This shows us that when African businesses receive investments, they can do exceptionally well. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, I'm almost convinced, but what about the risk of investing in a place like Africa? Well, this brings me back to my first point about the danger of thinking about Africa as a monolith. Africa is an enormous continent of 54 individual independent countries with their own governance structures, economic strengths, and yes, risk profiles. Smart investors parse out all of those differences across the 54 individual markets and then make a decision about where to invest. Would you use the average risk assessment for all 34 countries in North and South America to make a decision about whether to invest in the United States? Of course not. In the same way, a single risk assessment doesn't work for the entire African continent. There may be places where you decide it's too risky to place your bets. But if you look closely, I guarantee you'll find a place where your investment will be safe and bring in strong returns. I'll give a few examples. Did you know that Kenya ranks first in the world for protecting minority investors? Rwanda ranks third for registering and protecting property rights. Botswana is one of the world's safest countries and most stable democracies, and a shameless plug for Nigeria, as one of the world's largest populations of digital natives. There are a wide variety of opportunities across the continent. And if we make the right investments, we really could make Wakanda. <laughs> but if you're looking for real life examples of how investments have transformed economies, look to Singapore and Taiwan. It's hard to see it now, but in the 1960s, both countries were on similar economic footing with many newly independent African nations. But while Africa received earmarked aid programs with many strings attached, Singapore and Taiwan received sustained investments in the manufacturing sector, which paved the way for them to become the bastions of innovation and wealth that we know them to be today. Sustained investments can do the same for African countries. If we make the right investments, we could fund more entrepreneurs like E, and we could make sure that Africa's millions of young, educated, ambitious people don't lose their dreams. So I'll say it again. The question isn't whether to invest in African businesses. The question is when. Africa is the future of our planet. It is growing far faster than almost anywhere else in the world. And in the course of our lifetimes, it will be the center of growth, innovation, and creativity. The time to invest is now. Thank <laughs> you.